It's Wizards versus Lesbians, a podcast for your ears. Hello, and welcome to Wizards versus Lesbians. My name is Isaac. I'm Alexis. And today we are discussing The Book of Love by Kelly Link. Uh, would you like to do the plot or shall I? You shall. I see. Uh, well, <laughs> so uh, there are four childhood friends uh, living in the small coastal Massachusetts town of Love's End. Uh, as the book opens, they're all dead, um, but then they get better. and mm-hmm. uh, Very quickly. Very quickly. Um, with the help of... Uh, their music teacher, who appears to be magical. Um, these are uh, high school age kids, like l- mid to late high school age. Uh, then over the course of the book, we learn about their lives. Uh, we learn that uh, what the sort of main girl, Laura, has a sister named Susanna, who's kind of a fuck up. Um, and that there was uh, supposed to be some sort of uh, major thing happening that was supposed to go down with Susanna and Daniel, her friend. Uh, but it didn't happen. And as a result, they all died and they all got consigned to hell. And now they've been sent. Except for task, Susanna. Except for Susanna, who's not actually involved in the press process. And they are, uh, they have like, you know, your standard three magical days to complete three magical tasks that are assigned to them by their music teacher and his demon lover. Um, in whose realm they had until recently been languishing. Uh, And uh, if they manage to get through that, then maybe everything will be okay. Um, And through the course of the book, we learn all about their lives and their histories and their problems and their feelings. And uh, also the Queen of the Fairies shows up. Yeah, I think that's a a fairly good uh, summary. I'll, I'll I'll note that it opens with Susanna. That is true. That is true. When I say that Laura is the main girl, I mean that that's like her archetypal role in life in the world. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um. Um, Not necessarily the main character of the story. Yes. So uh, are there uh, wizards in this book? Oh, yeah. There's so many wizards in this book. This book is mostly wizards. Uh, And lesbians? Yes. Our main girl is, in fact, a lesbian. Yes. Um... And she is in conflict with the wizards, but is herself a wizard. Familiar territory for us. There's also a gender fluid, maybe trans guy, and um, some uh, and plenty of gay guys. Yeah, no, this is this book is set in the year 2016 and is very modern. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, I would say though that it is not particularly wizards versus lesbians in the sense that we mean it. Um, the the lesbian relationship is sort of incidental. The the main uh, relationship that the whole sort of story turns around is straight, um, and there's also a male male gay relationship, which is I would say probably gets more screen time and is more interesting than the lesbian relationship. This author writes very convincingly about being attracted to men, specifically. Yes, and also there's some things that the book does that are somewhat, um, I think, depart from the standard Wizards versus Lesbians ideas. Yes, if if all of the parents are like cartoonishly good and nice, then you are you can be relatively <laughs> certain that you're not in you know mainline Wizards versus Lesbians territory, um, and that's where we find ourselves. Uh, so why should you read this book? Well, Kelly Link has, is a very good short story writer. And I would say that, uh, there's some really good, like pretty imagery in here and, and interesting imagery. Yes. You just like, like scene to scene. There's often something that's really, you know, fun or cool to imagine happening. Yes. There's some memorable, there's some memorable imagery and some memorable, like sort of magical moments in here. Um, as to why you shouldn't read this book, uh, I really regret this because <laughs> I feel baited into it um, because like it's it's that sort of spinal tap shark sandwich thing where the book contains its own review in the title. But I'm afraid that I yes, have to. Yes, it's, it's the obvious thing. The book of love is long and boring. I had to read the damn thing. <laughs> 
but now I have, so you don't have to. No need to thank me. All right. Okay. That was very good rendition. I knew this was going to have to happen eventually in this episode. Um, mm -hmm. And I was a good job done and good job getting it over with quickly. Thank you very much. So, but uh, it is unfortunately both very long and quite dull, or at least it was to me. Um, the, the I'm not sure I'd call it dull, but I did find it. Excruciatingly slow. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd call it dull, but I definitely found it unsatisfying. It's an interesting thing because like I've, I've read long books before for this podcast where I've been like, I hate this book. I hate this book. I'm slogging through it. This is the first one where I'm like, I'm barely noticing that this book is happening. You know, like, mm. it's just, it's, they're like, it's, you can just sort of tune it out and not lose much because it likes to repeat itself a lot. And yes, the, the pacing is terrible. And once you sort of have the basic like personality dynamics down, which is the thing that the book is trading on. And since none of those really change, um, you can just sort of sit there and, uh, I just in found some it... ways, I, it, yeah. and the thing is that in some ways this reads like this could have been a short story. It could have this could have been a novelette. There is enough plot here for a really good short story, and I don't know why it's a novel that's one of the longest novels that we've read for the podcast. Instead, I genuinely, genuinely don't know. <laughs> Especially because Kelly Link is, in fact, really quite a good short story writer. Um, and so, yeah, this feels like, this feels like one of her short stories, but spun out to be very long, even by the standards of just like today's novels. Yes. Um, so that, that's a major reason not to read it. Uh, I would say that, um, it. if I were like a politically aware person of color, I might find the way that this book handles race um, condescending at best. Um, but, you know, that's not, that's obviously not really for me to say. Uh, it, this book feels very, um, very virtuous <laughs> to me. Um, it feels like it's going along ticking boxes. Uh, and, you know, that's that's obviously a sort of your mileage your mileage may vary sort of thing, but um, as far as like, but like really nothing particularly offensive happens in it either. So you know, if you start it and you feel like you're interested, you might as well keep going. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, do anything else before we do uh, content warnings? Uh, no, I I think that you know, yeah, I. And that, part of the problem, though, is that I wouldn't even say if you like the first couple chapters and you don't mind that nothing, plenty of things happen. They just don't feel like they have any meaning. Um, but unfortunately, the book doesn't really stay in the mode of its first few chapters either. Um, so you mm. can't even necessarily judge. From, like, it, it kind of goes off the rails at some point. I mean, honestly, if you find yourself like enjoying the sort of the setup of this little, you know, there's these, there's these kids in this little town, this little seaside town. And there's like this magic that has very clear rules, but nobody will tell them what the rules are. And there are wizards around, but they're plausibly deniable wizards. I would suggest reading um, Susan Cooper instead. Go and read Greenwich, <laughs> um, which is basically the same book, but much shorter and much better. Um, or you know any any of that series? Actually, this book has more in common with the, with the first book in that series, which is overlong and dull. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, you're right though. This is this does feel like it's kind of trying to be the American version of the Dark is Rising quintet. Um, personally, I think that the fifth book in that quintet is the worst, but the first one is kind of boring. It's you know they're they're. They're different in different ways. I'd love to do a bonus episode on the Dark is Rising series. Yeah, that, could, at some that point. could be a fun thing. Even it really contains zero lesbians and is mildly misogynist. But um, but maybe we could do it as a bonus episode. Anyway, now that we've gotten completely far afield, um, <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, lots of other people like this book. So I guess if you want to give it a try and 
you know, I guess if you really like Kelly Link's short stories and you don't feel any need for them to, you know, for the sort of pacing and um, emotional payoff and resolution of a traditional novel structure, then uh, you may enjoy this. Mm-hmm. Lots of people seem to have. Also, Sandman fans, there's plenty of Sandman in here. Oh, um, yeah, it's true. Which and is American also... Gods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, so there, if you want more of that kind of thing. All right. Content warnings. Um, Content warnings. Uh, it, well, death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people people are in hell for a while. Um, God, the, I mean, the rest, most of the rest of the of the like the violence and death. And this is so fairy tale that it almost like skates right past upsetting. Some of the some of the stuff with the fairy queen um, some of the things that she does to the, you know, poor unsuspecting town people, you know, with like the mind control stuff. Yeah, mind control is a is a concept. The, the mind sure. control yeah, the mind control stuff is like does feel occasionally quite creepy, so Yeah. Uh think the White Queen in Narnia. Um really think of uh, so many books that this is, you know, <laughs> similar to. All right. Uh but yeah, I literally can't think of anything else. I'm sure that we'll think of something as we're going through it. Horphobia. Horphobia. There's a bit of undigested horphobia in here. And now we're off to the spoiler zone. 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 All right. Anyway, spoiler zone. Spoiler zone. So I think that to sort of to... To make this not be quite a, the slog that it might be, I'd like to start with the thing, the things that I liked about the book. Okay, um, let's start on a positive note, ish. Yes. Um, so I, I think there, there are like two or three little scenes here which I think are really inspired. Um, uh, the first one that I want to mention is the one where Bowie and uh, Susanna go to the NICU um, to visit Susanna and Laura's mom. Uh, yes. Because it's like okay, so. Um, one of the sort of one of the major, you know, dynamics of or points of interest in this book is that there is, uh, in addition to our contemporary teens, we have two dead teens from the, the past, um, specifically uh, Scandinavia, circa sixteen hundred or so, I believe. I think um, so, yeah. And uh, I, I'm just going to say the past because the degree to which they are from the past and the degree to which they know things about the world is extremely loosey-goosey and varies a lot and i wish there had been maybe a little bit more research done about the specific time and place that they were from but i mean there may have been research done it just uh it, it does not, it, it feels more like the sort of misty past yeah like bowie like over the course of a couple of pages doesn't know what cellophane is but does know what a cell phone is um it's really just sort of whatever is convenient um but the 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 scene where Samantha and um, Bowie are on the bus to the NICU is great because these are two characters who are like out of time and not in the right place, you know, uh, both literally and figuratively. Like Samantha is this person who is trying to live a life that Susanna, uh, Susanna, sorry, Susanna is trying to live a life that nobody, you know, that doesn't have a place for her and you know her she's living in the shadow of her much more sort of uh overachieving sister uh and meanwhile bowie was a teenage prostitute (laughs) um you know they're both like they're both you know bad girls you know from very different times and places and uh i think the way that they bounce off each other uh over the course of that of their conversations in that little little zone is very charming. Um, and their dynamic, just in general, I I really enjoyed. And I wish that the novel had more of that. Yeah, they they barely interact otherwise, and there's nothing between them in like the denouement because Bowie ends up getting reincarnated as like twenty children, um, but <laughs> um, or possibly one child. We don't know. But uh, the but there there was that little sort of. There was some actual pep in their in their relationship, partially because it was a relationship that we hadn't gotten to see before, um, and that we didn't get to see again. And so, the one of the major problems of this book, where all of the characters sort of endlessly retread their dynamics with each other, 
um, didn't enter into it. And I was like, oh, this is like this nice little sharp burst of, of newness and actual like wit because they're both like really self-possessed people um, and they both have high areas of competence, but they're not the same areas of competence. So that's like it nicely, you know, goes between, oh, Bowie is like ancient and wise, but doesn't know how to ride a bus, you know, kind of thing. And is scared of, and doesn't like motion sickness, you know? Um, that might not seem like much, but it's, I'm pointing it out because it really stood out among the sort of the, 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 the basic, the baseline, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that their dynamic was also interesting because it was, you know, it, it wasn't weighed down with all these past relationship stuff, which, and, you know, occasionally worked, but often it just, it felt like the novelist was being really coy about what their relationships and relationship problems were. And so all the kids knew that. But, mm -hmm. you know, knew exactly why Susanna was mad at uh, Laura and, you know, what Daniel's deal is. But we, the reader, don't know that. And it's a really good example of why you shouldn't keep information from that all of your characters know and keeping it from your reader unless, like, unless you have a really good reason to. And I didn't feel like this book ever had a really good reason to keep any of the information. From uh, us? I mean, it, it was attempting to create momentum by parceling stuff out. But the thing is that, like, most of that stuff was implicitly clear in the way that they treated each other, and it didn't really matter why, you know? Right. Like, um, exactly. You know, it was clear that Susanna and Daniel had a thing um, that was no longer, that, you know, that was cur currently off, partly because he was dead. Um, uh -huh. And. Mo's resentment against Daniel is like really obvious, even if you don't have the, you know, that specific incident with the racist teacher. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and also with the, like telling his, you know, telling his dad, you're not my dad. Um, mm -hmm. like that felt that was, that was presented as such a big reveal. And it was like, okay, the big reveal is that you're still not over petty stuff from being a child, which is fine that none of these people are over any of their petty stuff from being children. Because they're still kind of children. I mean, I think they're all like nineteen at this point. Um, yeah, and that's fine. That the point of a fairy tale is, or of this kind, I would think, is that like people going on heroes' journeys and individuating in some way, and they're all the same children after that they are before, as far right. as I well, can tell. And actually, this is both. I think the biggest letdown of the novel for me, and also the way in which it is the least Wislas, um, yes. is that. It, you know, the ending, they don't learn anything about themselves. They get the thing that the wizard figure has been dangling in front of them, which is power. Yep. Uh, yep, yep. Their social dynamics are entirely unchanged. Um, yep. And, and like, the twist is that actually the wizard was the good guy all along. It's a very long and slow capitulation to the way things have to be go to the way things have to go isaac yes um it's it's uh it's it's bad and like the the i mean it's, it's really funny that i didn't even get through the one of the three things that i liked about this book before <laughs> we started down this road well we can, we but, can go like, back and forth um, we can we can indeed go back and forth. Like here here's my here's my read on why that is, right? Okay. Um everybody all of the characters in this book are middle class. Um, which is actually also unusual for Wizles. Well, um, Mo is upper middle class. When I say I, I should say yeah. middle class or above. Um <laughs> yes. they're all they're all comfortable. Like even Daniel, like who is supposed who is the one who's like his family's worried about money, it's like, you know, they own their house. Um, right. Everybody, everybody in this book owns their own house and in a rural but touristy town. Um, yes, in a, in, a, in a pretty nice town. Like, I mean, if you want to, <laughs> that's actually funny to me. It's like, you know, the, the, this book starts with the characters in hell and, you know, they, they all can't describe it. Actually, one of the most effective things that the book does is like this, this description of like how none of them can agree what hell actually was just that they it was the worst thing in the world like that actually came through and i believed it but over the course of the book uh it's like hell is this is love's end like hell is this very large box of unpleasant bougie donuts that they have to get through you know <laughs> like 
this is, you know, a this is a little liberal enclave where nothing changes and where everybody is comfortable and like the the most, you know, sort of important dangerous thing is like okay, is this is this child going to be the black sheep or are they going to be successful or are they going to be phenomenally successful? And like the black sheep is, you know, maybe she goes to the city and does drugs, you know, or 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 has a bad pregnancy or something, you know, there are no, which could be actually pretty catastrophic for somebody's life, but yeah. 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 But it's like, as far as like apocalyptic stakes go, you know, and not even apocalyptic stakes, but as far as like the human stakes for these people go, they're all going to be pretty much okay. You know, they all come from loving families. You know, I don't know about that. I think like, there is, a, for one thing, they did randomly die. And of course, yes, they came back, which does, I guess, so it is a very good example of that upper, that middle to upper middle class safety of you can, you know, literally ex- experiment with bad black magic and send yourselves to hell, but there's still a safety net. Um, but like, you know, it's, I don't think that that, I think that the sense of safety is more, isn't necessarily about their circumstances because actually somebody can be in a loving middle-class family and still face pretty apocalyptic stakes. I think that the sense of safety is more that the book loves its characters so much that it doesn't want to ever put them into any kind of, you know, they're, they're never really face any bad stakes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the thing is that we don't get any closer to, like the the book begins with that sense of visceral horror and never comes back to it. I know, which is you which know? is one of my it's other, like... <laughs> my my two real disappointments with this book are this that one the reveal of oh actually the creepy manipulative music teacher really had your best interests at heart the entire time, um, and actually it is good to have this magic and you know become a new god and then do absolutely nothing with it except continue you know play guitar. Um, mm-hmm. and also that it, you know, the sense of loss and emptiness and horror at the beginning just completely falls away very quickly. And the book is, the book makes it very clear that how low the stakes are, despite, you know, the kid, the kids keep getting told, oh, the stakes are so high. Oh, you're going to go back to hell if you don't do this right. But Daniel absolutely refuses to ever do any of the tasks he has set. And each time he is basically just given a pass. Yeah, he's bailed out. Like even the part, the part where he's like, you know, okay. So the metaphor here is that you are, you are. T- I mean, these are all talented people, um, you know, and it's very important that they explore their gifts and use their gifts because if they reject their gifts, then you know, they're going to ruin their lives. And Daniel is refusing to to do the gift because it might make him, it might give him power over other people, which is, you know, that's a relatable conundrum. You know, right, for like a, for actually, a I don't think that the, actually I don't think that these things that you want me to do are ethical. Um, right, exactly. I'm opting out it, of the entire system. Right, which is a, definitely a choice. And the book goes, okay, oh ho ho. Well, you know, if you you know if what you uh, bring out of yourself will save you, but we what you do not bring out of yourself will destroy you. Uh, when you're not letting this out of yourself, then you know you're going to repress it all, and you're going to become this beast, and you're going to hurt people by accident. And I'm going to literally turn you into a bear and set you on your own siblings to, you know, just does- to drive that point home. And then it's cheated out of it by the power of heterosexual love. <laughs> it doesn't even have the courage of its convictions in that tiny little way, you know. Like, well, also, like, he's a bear, and he's still able to make, you know, just enough right choices to avoid ever hurting anybody. He should have eaten his siblings. At least one. <laughs> or at least, like, scared them and crashed mm-hmm. the house. There should I have guess- been some sort of consequence for this setup. It was It's like the, the scariest thing that the book presents, you know, <laughs> and it's just like, nope, never mind. Everything's fine. We wake up the next morning. I'm not a bear anymore. <laughs> um unbelievable. <laughs> it does make you somewhat sympathetic uh for Mo's just constant exasperation that Daniel seems to get every single thing handed to him. Yes, because Daniel does get every single thing handed to him. Exactly. Uh, but Mo is also extremely rich, and so I have less uh I have less sympathy for him than I might. Um so uh let's see. I've I've 
But it, give me a second here. I'm trying to find thing number two that I like in my <laughs> notes. <laughs> look through my notes. It's time to look through my notes. There's only two things I like about this, and I just found third. Don't know where I got the inspiration or how she wrote the words. Spent my whole life just digging up this novel's shallow grave for the two things I liked about it, and the third one I just made up, found. Okay, never mind. Actually, that's that was the second thing that I liked. The setup to that part. Oh, okay. <laughs> it literally. So that's the second thing that I liked. Literally, was the setup to that. It's like refusing the call. He becomes dangerous. He's a pervert. He won't admit it. But we cheat out of it. You know, mm -hmm. at that point. Um, but I will tell you that the third thing that I liked was the unintentional, possibly slapstick humor of uh, Laura dragging her dead mom across town on a sled. <laughs> Um, <laughs> to to uh, Malo Mog's tacky, tacky temple. Um, I found that really enjoyable. <laughs> um, I don't know if the book thinks it was funny, um, but I certainly did. And uh, I liked Malo Mog as a character, okay? You know, like if you're going to do a modern fairy queen, some like, you know, coo like rich cougar who is like, you know, toys with people and abandons them and uses her love as uh, like her genuine love as a manipulative force. Sure. You know, I'll go with that. She was definitely, that was definitely the most Sandman thing also with like the way, you know, and that's an example of things happening, you know, to of actual bad lasting, bad things happening to people uh, because the book does suddenly raise its stakes when once Malo Mog shows up and erects a temple to herself. Um, yes. You know, the the mom gets killed, and um, but also the, the these random lawyers who you know she appears to have like shown up in their house, possibly on the pretense of having a threesome, and then just like brainwashes them and uses them as her puppets from there on out. That was very sand many. It was very sand many. Um, it also, but it's also like bad things happening to people who we don't care about. You know, right? That part that's like, part of the problem is we don't really care about them. They're they're, you know, I actually do tend to care about lawyers, but not necessarily that kind of lawyers. Lawyers were often the punchlines in the cartoons I watched growing up. I remember particularly the full-length musical episode of Eek the Cat called Quadrupedia. Does anybody remember Eek the Cat? Well, anyway, even though my dad was a lawyer, I didn't really mind it because I could use those punchlines to bully him. Yeah, and, you know, we have the line cook who t gets turned into a tiger and hit by a car. Um, and we have uh, and we have the mom who, up until that point, has simply just been the world's best mom. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, and has no character other than, like, she's an IC, like, she's a, a, inf a NICU nurse, you know, and is still, you know, raising two girls on her own and, uh, like... You know, just the, the a paragon of virtue with no complications. Um, and I felt about her dying as I would about a prop falling off of a stage. Mm. Um, but it does that does bring us to the the matter of the doppelgangers. Yes, so the doppelgangers. So I I twigged that the stepdad wasn't real before the <laughs> issue of doppelgangers was even raised. Because I was like, well, we're in a reality that's been constructed by by uh, Mr. What's His Face, the music teacher, um, so and this guy showing up right now is extremely convenient. So I'm guessing that there's something weird with him. But mm -hmm. then it turns out that a bunch of other people didn't actually exist. Um, yes. And uh, I actually read this. This is one of the more interesting things in the book, I think, mm -hmm. um, just as a sort of narrative trick. Uh, but also as a sort of, uh, um, it's very Jungian, um, not to, not to drop the J word, but, uh, <laughs> it's, I don't think it's an accident that they're all of the opposite sex of the people who, for whom they are doppelgangers. Oh yeah. No, that's a good point. I think these are projected anima slash animus, mm -hmm. um, you know, missing dad, missing mother, essentially in most case. It's missing dad, missing mom, missing extra little sister well i think that i daniel's one is the most interesting because there is a trans narrative in there um 
if and a braver person might have gone digging for it. <laughs> um, like the the idea that you know this your your shadow, the thing that you really need to make your life worth living is your own special, like you know, uh, you know, gifted pixie of a of a black little sister who you can you know stand up for and be righteous about and you know make sure that she grows up with the name that she wants. Right. You know, and, not the name that anybody gives to her. Right. Well, and also that, you know, it it is it is very telling that Daniel's um, magical uh, shadow comes with her very own racist teacher for Daniel to stand up against. Exactly. Like she she completes him. He's the ultimate white liberal and she completes him. <laughs> you know, she is the little black girl inside him that he can protect and foster. Um, and I found that like. I found that to be kind of funny that the rest of the book doesn't seem to, uh, <laughs> you know, aspire to. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, that was. And also, um, I I did like that. That was actually one of the things the book does fairly subtly and thus well is that it's showing that even though Moe's specific grievances against Daniel are incredibly petty, his read on who Daniel is, is actually spot on. Spot on. Yeah. Now Moe's Moe's an extremely good judge of character, uh, and you know that because he is smart, um, and you know that he's smart because he talks the most like the narrative voice of the book <laughs> of any of the other characters. Um, the and like the ability to sort of whip out quippy sitcom dialogue is also a thing that intelligent people in this universe have. Yes, that's true, and Moe's definitely the quippiest of the bunch. It's incredibly annoying. I immediately <laughs> wanted horrible things to happen. To him. <laughs> um, although I did, I did, I did end up warming to him over the course of the book. As did I. I think, I think the point where it turned out that he had written a song that he'd never been able to perform of all of the sex acts that he really wanted to do with another guy and never could, and that he finally has sex. And his first thought is, "Great, I can check off so many things on my song." Well. <laughs> Yeah, no, I that think was that, actually really like, charming. Mo and uh, the dead boy, whose name I can't remember. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna go the with dead that. boy, who I found kind of annoying, honestly. But well, you but know, they, he, but as he... a couple, they're very cute. Now I'll tell all my friends I fell in love with the dead boy. Now I'll tell my family I wish I wish you could have met him But you're also dead I guess you do end up marrying your mother after all In the form of a dead boy I should stop Okay Yeah, you know, the dead boy has the, like you know, I am hyper competent, but emotionally dead thing, which makes him the perfect uke for a semi like uh, like Mo. But um, <laughs> the uh, actually, I think it might have been the other way around, but I, I, think I don't it remember. Might have been but the other way it around, was the other but... way around. But <laughs> <laughs> emotionally speaking, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can dig your way out of this one. No, no, no. But he does. He does have that sort of that. He is. He's the cold one to to most fiery one. Yes. We're we're not going to say anything about the races of the people involved and how that might relate to that dynamic. But, um, so I've gotten through all of the three thing the three things that I like about this book <laughs> at this point. Um, so I think that like one of the issues that I have um, with the book as a whole is just that it seems kind of threadbare. Um, and by that, I mean, like, well, it's sort of interesting. It's like, there, there's a, there's a funny little, there's a lot of like funny little meta jokes in this book, right? Mm -hmm. Um, like, oh, the bar is called the cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. Um, and below it is where the corpses of our main characters are, you know? <laughs> um, it's like, and like, uh, they keep talking about like Harry Potter and the Hunger Games and, you know, about happy endings and, you know, about characters. And somebody at some point uh, said, oh, you know, if I ever write you, I'll make sure to make your dialogue better, which is the thing, the one thing in this book that made me almost stop reading it. Um, <laughs> but it's like there's there are all these nods to it's like this is a story. Stories are important. Authors are magicians. Magic is important. Stories are magic. 
you know, as one might expect from somebody with this sort of creative parentage, um, mm-hmm. as it were. And um, that's fine. But the thing is that, like, we've created, like, this this reality that has been half created by magic. So, like, inconsistencies are fine mm-hmm. because it's all kind of a play act anyway. It's all kind of a sort of, you know, dumb show with 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 uh with like you know weird little things around the edges so it's like okay people are talking like they're in a tv show people are talking like they're in a sitcom okay we're in a sort of a fictional zone i'll accept that you know there are a bunch of little uh little inconsistencies with characterization and a bunch of little inconsistencies with what people know and when and there is a bunch of like world building stuff that doesn't check out um, and nothing like big enough to get mad about just little things. Um, and like, yeah, no, this works. The, the, the way that this place is like super sort of hazy and, you know, static works for the concept, but it makes it very difficult for me to like, hold on to anything, which is one of those, one of the reasons that I felt like I was drifting through the entire book. Like it does, it definitely feels drifting. I also felt like I was drifting through the entire book. I think that it's also, the problem is that this talks a lot about, you know, this is very much a story about stories, but it feels more like a pastiche than, you know, like the inconsistencies don't ever seem to mean anything. A lot of stuff that gets set up doesn't really ever pay off. Um, It just, that I want my meta narratives to feel to if we're going to do this sort of very affected artificial thing, I want the construction to pay off in some way. And yes. I think you know, my real problem here was that there, it didn't really ever feel like it was paying off. It just sort of drifted from clever, beautifully written moment to clever, beautifully written moment. Um, but without necessarily, but it stepping back. And looking at it from the whole, you know, and I, of course, I, I went through it much faster than you because I didn't listen to the audiobook, And even mm-hmm. so, you know, moment to moment, I was like, OK, OK, but I can I, I can keep reading this even. Um, but when I put it down, I didn't there wasn't any sense of resolution or of wanting to go back or like, there was any sense of resolution, but there also wasn't any sense of non-resolution. Um, yeah no that's the thing and it's like everybody's still you know now laura has achieved literal godhood and the two and you know our two figures are broken out of their stasis and another two figures are slotted in but nobody's nobody has changed at all like everybody is still the exact same role in the story mo is the only one who changes at all yeah um uh, it, it, that the, the sort of the, the end point for Laura was was like r- alarming <laughs> and very strange. It's like, yeah, you know, absolute power and wealth is is great as long as we have somebody who's like vaguely responsible, you know, to handle it. And like, and nothing about Laura has convinced me that she is vaguely responsible to handle it. No, in fact, like when, we have just given an extremely, we've just given a fairly repressed. Um, somewhat bratty 19 year old lesbian godlike powers i think you know what laura by the end of the book i was like laura grows up to be taylor swift <laughs> oh no oh no she does doesn't she yeah um like because of course that's what she wants to use her godlike powers for is to you know become and is to become a musician on the scale of taylor swift who can like completely change the economies of mid-sized towns um, right exactly <laughs> <laughs> oh no no you're absolutely right <clears throat> and you know like Susanna and so always Susanna was the most disappointing because the book opens with her sense she's experienced this loss and it has locked her into stasis mm-hmm. and she can't you know she can't move on past her college boyfriend or probably her high school boyfriend uh she can't move on with her life like she can't you know she can't decide whether or not she's going to college um she can't you know she just can't move forward because she's experienced this huge loss of her you know her friend her boyfriend her on again on again boyfriend and her sister and they she doesn't even know if they're dead like if she knew for sure that they were dead she could probably move on and not be trapped in this holding pattern in this small town forever um sure. and her ending is 
that she is trapped in a holding pattern forever, magically. Where, like, even the same stasis with her boyfriend of they're linked, they're bound together, but they can't ever make eye contact. They can never be facing each other while speaking. Like, everything about her situation at the beginning has been literalized through magic. (laughs) Um, And, which, you know, it... And and the book seems to present this as a win, or at least a draw. I mean, she's 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 goth, which means that what she's really wanted to do is to be queen of hell, you know, for the entire thing. This is her self actualization. It's just it's you know it's it's just, it's such a tragedy, actually. It is. It's like I mean, maybe that's what the book is saying when it's like, oh, is there going to be a happy ending? Will this, you know, like Harry Potter and the Hunger Games, is this going to be a happy ending? And turns out maybe not. Maybe we're not giving the book enough credit. No. Um. I mean, you know, it's it's possible, but it, it it is possible that actually this is supposed to be a tragedy that like, it, you know, um and that we're supposed that everybody basically being trapped in their adolescent roles forever um with the with the exception of mo who now gets to be the the snarky one but with a boyfriend um right. which is you know maybe like maybe that's really supposed to be and the and the idea that you know actually Laura is going to use her power responsibly maybe we're supposed to look at the rest of the entire book and go wow this was just a failure at all points. The adults who we thought were, you know, all of the adults were awful, both including all the, you know, we're not supposed to trust any of the authorities here, except, um, and despite what the narrative keeps telling us. And if that's the case, then it still could have been a good 300 pages shorter, but I would call that a success, except that it is sufficiently ambiguous that I, you know, I feel like I'm making a, you know the the con- the uh, devil's advocate case for this book. Yeah, and like the thing that sort of that opens up again, like that argues against it to me, um, is the what I mentioned earlier. The book's like absolute, you know, unending insistence that the that the most important thing is art, um, and that like the tragedies of these teens' lives is that they are drift. Like Mo can't share his songs with anybody. Daniel's giving up music because it's not practical, you know. Um, like they're they're all, uh, you know, the the thing the things that are sort of keeping them stuck are their inability to bring out that sort of latent magic, which is you which know is a their good art. thing. The wishes yes. give them, which is their art, and it was created that. But and it's like this is. Um, I don't think that's ironic. I don't think that there's a double meaning there. I think that the I think yeah, that I know do- exactly because because the ending is also presented in as they all finally get access to their art, um, right? And we also have well, let, let's talk about Mo's grandmother, shall we? Um, sure. So so I maybe I'll preface this by saying like okay, I'm I make music. Um, Music in this book feels like it is being described by somebody who does not make music, but who has read some books about it. Or possibly a single book by John Cage. That was the jingle. You get it? Um, and in the same way, the the uh, the black writer of roman- of romance fiction... And her whole story feels like a person has read has read a few books about race, um, like up to you know we went on a Wikipedia page for famous black women who we can make statues of to put them you know throughout town. There's a list we're going to place mm-hmm. them here, 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 and here, um, and like we get this sort of when she when she dies we get this like you know completely out of pace with everything else in the book like this little bubble narrative of that is like the story of her entire life which could have been another book you know um which is about sort of you know the importance of you know the importance of fiction the importance of you know hope and romance fiction the importance of identity this actually really annoyed me though because part of her big tragedy is that she writes like her one black romance and it doesn't sell very well and so she has to go back to sadly writing white people but like 
I used to work in a library and also a bookstore in Atlanta. Urban romance is an extremely successful, financially successful no, that was, that genre. Was part, that was part of her. That was part of the whole thing. I know part of the whole thing is that she's supposed to have created it, but like, it, that's not it. It's been a successful <laughs> genre for a while. I guess she is really old, but yeah, no. Apparently, like apparently in the 1980s, she created romance with black people. <laughs> but like, I'm pretty sure it existed in the 1980s. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it did. Yes. <laughs> there's this whole like, but she she broke it into the mainstream because there's the blah, 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 blah. weirdly by inventing a fictional writer it seems like it erases the contributions of the actual writers the ones who actually wrote and popularized this genre by the book's own logic it's an act of erasure and you know like and for that reason, it's entirely reasonable that she has more money than God. Um, I mean, the, you know. like being a highly successful romance author is entirely reasonable. She, she also she doesn't have more money than God. She has enough money that she can uh, do whatever she wants in a small touristy town on like off on the Massachusetts coast. That's yes. You don't even have to be that rich to you know take over a town somewhat. I suppose so, you know. And they, it's think, like, like pick pick a ran- <laughs> like pick a random town um and look for how many times a given name shows up. And well, well this well this is the interesting thing. It's like it's also it's a, another one of those like you know, it's it's the same thing as the ending of the book where it's like, you know, it's fine. Like the the it's okay if a single person can control an entire town like Coach Bacula. <laughs> you know, in uh, in X Wives of Dracula, as long as she's a wise, kindly old magical black woman, you know, um, right? Or or a you know young white lesbian with protagonist power, right? It's like you know, as long as we have the people with the right you know, with the right bona fides and the right ideas and the right beliefs, you know, who say the right things in these positions, then you know the absolute authority and the wealth inequality and you know the ability to fuck with the, the normies is completely fine you know really it's sort of this it, it one of the reasons this book felt so odd to me was that it felt like a victory lap when like where part of the race course has already fallen off the edge of a cliff if you'll forgive the metaphor <laughs> like it, it's like we we're losing I don't know what you're celebrating. <laughs> this system isn't working. It's obvious that it's not working. We're not going to fix, save it or fix it by putting, you know, a new name tags on people. Honest to God. But maybe that's just me. That it may be a little bit of you reading your own politics into the novel, into this novel, which, you know, I think we all do read some of our own politics into the books that we read. But I think, you know, that's, I just... It didn't, the part, for me, it wasn't that it felt out of sync with the times. It's that, though it did a little bit, but um, it's that it felt, it felt like a victory lap, but the person doesn't seem to be aware that they're just driving in the wrong direction or something. Like, <laughs> it just, it just, it felt like this victory lap where they're declaring victory over the super meaningless stuff and not noticing all the things that have, you know all the like lives that have been destroyed and including the lives of our protagonists. This is, I mean, this is like diversity when, you know, the new dictator is Taylor Swift, you know, but lesbian, the, but lesbian, like it's the, le- the Taylor Swift lesbian fandom version of Taylor Swift. Right. Cause um, I, there's one thing I've learned from <laughs> Tumblr and it is that some people inexplicably think Taylor Swift is a lesbian and there is, According to Tumblr, and I, I fairly convincingly, absolutely no evidence for this. Um, no, there is not. <laughs> but, so, um, but uh, regardless, um, you know, it's like there you go. You know, and maybe I don't, I don't, I don't really get it. Um, I guess that's at the end of the day, this book was is for people who are not me. I then proceeded to go off on a nitpick, which I meant to be representative of the many small problems I had with this book, but in fact, I misremembered this one completely. So maybe I did that for the rest as well. Please take my opinions with the usual handful of salt. Bowie's narrative. You would, you know, you would think that I would be really into the like shapeshifter, gender queer, uh, vaguely trans mask, but not seeming 
deeply invested in being male narrative and i was it was unfortunate that one also felt very well we need to add a trans character yeah and it's like if you're gonna do that can you maybe not name them david bowie you know that was definitely some like very being very precious about it we're we're a little we're a little on the nose here folks uh you know and with the heterochromia and such um but, to be fair, Bowie totally sounds like a name that you know that a that a trans mask uh, person, person would choose for himself. for them slash himself. Yeah, yeah, um, this is true. Uh, dog names, as my friend Max uh, <laughs> likes to say. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I I don't really the whole like. So that I get, I guess the whole you know the whole Bowie and dude whose name I don't remember and Malamog bit is like okay we're 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 doing fairy tales here right yeah um, and you know that there and it's like you know okay we we ran the fairy tale once you know back in the in fairy tale days um, and now we're running the the same fairy tale again now and like how is it different between you know them and then and now um, and I'm like. And, you know, there's the sort of the destined meeting and there's the boy who's, you know, in the thrall of the fair folk and we're going to do a Tamlin on him and, you know, rescue him. Um, But like, this is, this is a bit tangential, but it's just a a, a thought that I, that I had Mm -hmm. um, reading this is like, you know, that the sort of thing where it's like, one of the things about fairy tales, right, is like the, these, these kids um are going and having these adventures which are you know incredibly perilous and life-changing you know it's the sort of the the you know they're they're going to become adults or they're going to die you know or they're going to become good adults or they're going to become you know wastes Uh uh-huh uh and like i think that one of the major challenges with like doing fairy tales in the modern age is that the human life expectancy is much longer now (laughs) Um, like you can't, I mean, it's, it's certainly possible to fuck up your life irrevocably when you're 18, but there's a lot of time to dig yourself out these days. Um, and like, I wonder, I'm wondering if, if you were going to do a sort of, uh, more modern day fairy stories, if it wasn't like, you know, kids in their sort of early or late twenties or, or their mid to late twenties who are like deciding whether they're going to. At that point, they're not really you know, kids, but yes. Well, kids in quotes but like main characters for in the in the fairy story maybe it makes more sense if they're a little bit older now that you know given the way that the the culture has changed because i mean this could just this might just be us being old people being like well what the story really needs to be about is about old people (laughs) but i did i did have that i mean i've written multiple times in my notes i'm too over 40 to care about any of this (laughs) um like these they're these relatively comfortable kids and their emotional traumas i'm like meh you know, maybe that's my problem. <laughs> this is one of those, you know, um, like, I do wonder how much of this is you looking at a bunch of kids from, you know, somewhat broken families, but still relatively comfortable and, in you know, with their little band and deciding whether or not to go to college and just hating them because they remind you of yourself when you were that age. <laughs> maybe, you know, I mean, I didn't actually like I didn't hate them i found mo extremely annoying um i thought that laura was a pretty bad person but i think the book also thinks yes. that Laura's a pretty bad person um and i think and i have a lot of i have a lot of affection for daniel and his and and carousel his anima um, <laughs> yes his tulpa carousel i found that really really charming yes um and if mo didn't write like uh if doe didn't talk like the author of the book that I'm annoyed at writes, I would probably have liked him better, (laughs) but, um, you know, that's, but that's pretty much the, I, yeah, it's not, it's not, it really wasn't hatred for me. It was, I mean, as I said at the top, like I've, I've read books that I hated. I didn't hate this one. This one just sort of went past me. And at the end of it, I was just like, how did I, how did I spend this long (laughs) in this book and not get anything from it? You know, (laughs) That is, I mean, I do feel like this book could have been much more tightly edited and that that would have, that, you know, I think there could have been a much better book in here, but yes, 
it feels a little bit like a wasted potential. There is literally a scene 60% of the way through where like they're going from character to character and, and they're like, and Mo's like, okay, what's your heart's desire? You know, what's your super objective <laughs> character in this book? Good. What's your super objective right. character in this book? And I'm like, not only do we already know this because we've already spent <laughs> an, an enormous amount of time with it, but why are we, this is for your notes. This is, this doesn't go in the book. <laughs> you know? Come on. Oh, I don't know. I remember people messaging you on Tumblr being like, so what's your shining thing? Um. I'm a real person. I'm not a fictional character. <laughs> uh, and also I didn't answer that question. Oh, I know you did. a very didn't. dangerous question to answer. Right. No, exactly. Um... <laughs> But, you know, uh, I, it is a reasonable thing. That thing is that, that actually felt like the kind of stupid conversation that I had as a teenager. Oh, yeah. No, no. I liked uh, it. It seemed I'm not saying that it didn't seem realistic for these characters to have it. But we were so this book is all, never lets you forget that you're in a story. Yeah. It's called The Book of. Right. And ever the chapters are The Book of X. Yeah. And so I'm like. All right, the book of this is too on the nose and should not be in the book. It should be in your notes. You yes, know? a lot of this is is unfortunately too on the nose. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's I I was definitely a bit disappointed, um, but but lots of people really love this thing apparently. So. Um, maybe, maybe this is a good book for teens, you know, and like, maybe... I think most of the people who love this are adults with MFAs, actually, but this then is not a no YA, excuse. this is not a YA novel. Um, no excuse. This book as a, as a piece of literature, this is awful. I'm, I'm sorry. Like it's poorly, it's poorly constructed. It's, it, it's like flashily, but, but shallowly written. It's not, doesn't feel real. I think part of the problem might also just be that this is written for a lit fic audience and not necessarily for a genre audience. Um, I read lit fic. I know you do. I also read a fair <laughs> amount of lit fic, and a lot of it has this a similar thing of um, cleverness over anything else. If you're going to do that, it has to also have subtlety. Um but anywho, I think you're going to do that. It just also has to be, you know, ideally under 300 pages, but ideally, I mean, we can dream. <laughs> um, the, I'm going to edit this out, but Keanu yes. just finished reading blood Meridian by Carmack McCarthy. And was like, <laughs> <laughs> well, that didn't amount to anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> some really good sentences in here, but that didn't. Right. Well, no, see, that's <laughs> that, that's the MFA novel. And this isn't an MFA novel, but that is the thing that I think often comes out of, um, Especially, honestly, that comes out of people who are, you know, trained to write brilliant short stories. Um, and that you don't necessarily you have the, there's not necessarily the commercial or editorial or internal pressure to have a plot that moves. Indeed. Um, yes. I think, I think that I am happy to stop beating this, this horse at this point. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, no, we, uh, it was, I, 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 I I came away disappointed. I'll just I'll just put it that way. Um, but next time, what are we doing next time? Um, oh, we're doing something very short. We're doing Carmilla with commentary by Carmen Maria Machado. Oh, I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah, that, that'll be, be nice. That'll be a, a nice anecdote. This is going to be antidote. our this is going to be our most retroist of retros with Carmilla. Indeed. All right. Um, I will look forward to that and uh, look forward to seeing you all next time on Wizards vs. Lesbians. Bye. Bye-bye. One of the many little things that annoyed me about this book is that the epitaph uh, from the Song of Solomon is rendered as love is as strong as death, which strikes me as a reflection of uh, a lack of courage of one's convictions in a book called The Book of Love, you know? So I'm going to give you a rendition of the correct translation uh, as set to a melody by Baby D. Here's truth. Your songs would make an angel choke. Here's justice. A robin eaten by a worm. Your very likeness lies in that rotten joke, and mercy is in the hiding of it. So set me as a seal on your heart, 
as a seal on your arm. For love is stronger than death, more jealous than the tomb. The embers of a fire come from God that all the water in the world cannot consume. So set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm. <laughs>